Leonard has them? Leonard? Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming and joining with us at our last light service here in Craiga. Just to say, as you will be aware, there is a watch night service this evening as well at 11.30 in Glenburn. And again, if you feel you want, you would be more than welcome to, to join us there. The only thing I'll say to you is it may be a bit familiar to, to, to know uh, in that respect. I trust you all have two things, one a folded hymn sheet and the second a sheet for New Year's Eve. And we're just going to start the service with the greeting. And again, would you just please share with me in the words that are typed in the bold print. Tonight is a night to celebrate freedom from bondage and oppression. Tonight we reclaim the truth that our lives have always mattered. Tonight we remember the cost and courage, lives and human anguish to give us our birthright of freedom. Tonight we thank Jesus and all those who have followed the divine example, making it possible for us to have so much to celebrate. And tonight we accept our responsibility to protect and expand those same freedoms for those still oppressed and for those who will come after us. We're going to turn to the hymn sheet and sing our first hymn, a wonderful hymn by Charles Wesley, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling.
A wonderful hymn that just at the end of one year just simply reminds us us of the promises that we have today and the end of this year are the same as we will have at the start of a new year tomorrow. Can I ask you to turn to the tall sheet and to the invocation? And again, please respond in the words in the type, the bold print, sorry. The end of the year is upon us. And tonight we gather to offer the strides as well as the struggle of this year to God. We gather to give to the Creator both our hopes and our fears as we gather to worship the Lord our God. Holy Spirit, fill our hearts and our lives tonight as we worship. Grant us each the strength to sing our sing, to pray our prayer, and to listen for the word that will drive our fears away and move us to offer praise and thanksgiving. Inspire us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we stand before you at the end of one day or one year and the start of another. And yet as we are reminded, you are the same yesterday, today and tomorrow. So while we face this change of year, let us just rest in the knowledge that, Lord, you have not changed. Lord, it's been a year of many different struggles. As church families, we have lost family and friends from our fellowships. And Lord, we remember them today. Lord, some of the loss may be maybe 12 months away. Some are more a recent memory. But Lord, we thank you for those peoples whose lives have helped influence us, who helped us to stand here and to continue our witness to you. And Lord, as we go into the new year, perhaps full of New Year's resolutions and things that we plan to do or things that we're going to do ourselves to make life better, Lord, the greatest thing we can do is to stay in your arms, just to stay and stay close to you as we journey forth, not knowing what lies ahead, but the certainty that you are there before us. So Lord, be with us this evening. And Lord, be with us as we enter this time of change in the calendar. So Lord, we come before you and say the words of the prayer you taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. One of our scripture readings for this evening, I'm going to do in the form of the dialogue for New Year's Eve. And as you can see, it's based on that well-known text from Ecclesiastes, there is a time for... And it shows the juxtaposition of life. There's a time for living, a time for dying, a time for laughter, and a time for crying. So let's just share in this reading from God's Word. For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to to be born, and a time to die. A time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. God has made everything suitable for its time. God has put a sense of past and future into our minds. God has done this so that all should stand in awe before him. Whatever God does endures forever. Amen. Thank you. We're going to again turn just to the hymn sheet and to the second hymn. One that just again has that sense of just as we've done together in that dialogue 
that God has made everything suitable. God has put a sense of past and future into our minds. And yet we are now to sing the wonderful hymn, Thy hand, O God, has guided thy flock from age to age. The wonders take its written full clear on every page. As the years come and change, we still celebrate that we do share in that belief that we still have one church, one faith, and one Lord. I'm going to turn now to the letter to the Romans, chapter 5. I'm just going to read five verses, one to five. If you want to follow along in the church Bibles, you'll find it on page 1132. 1132. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our suffering because we knew that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Amen. And we thank God for this reading from his holy word. Here we hear how things happen. We hear that suffering produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. And often that when we go through life struggles, it is the hope of others who steer us through because they share of their own experience. I've entitled this short reflection, A New Attitude for a New Year. Charles Swindon says this, The longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. Attitude to me is more important than facts, than the past, than education, than money, than circumstances, than failure, than successes, than what other people think or say or do, than appearances, than giftedness or skill. It will make or break a company, a church, or a home. 
What he's saying is it's our attitude and how we face things that will make the mark in life. The remarkable thing is that we have a choice every day regarding the attitude we will embrace for that day. I remember once when I worked in NIE being going on to a course in stress management. Now, we were stressed as they find out why we were selected to go on a stress course, but anyway, we went. But the person said, you can choose to be stressed. You can choose in how you approach things each day. And often we can forget the obvious in front of us because we're already putting barriers in place. We cannot change our past. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is to play in the one thing we have, and that is our attitude. I'm convinced that perhaps life is 10% what happens to me and 90% on how I react to it in that moment. Maybe you might swap them percentages about a bit. But I can see what he's getting at. Swindon is right. It's not what happens to us that is important. It's how we respond to it. It's not what life brings, but what we bring to life that matters. How often have you been encouraged by someone's story who's facing a hardship, and yet their faith is strong? I think there are some keys in this area of attitude in life that are important. One of the first things for me in attitude is to be authentic. You've got to be who you say you are and not just put on a reaction to get a response. Be real is perhaps what I'm saying. Be yourself. There's a wonderful advert on TV, and I was thinking about this, and maybe you'll pick it up if you watch the adverts, and the song goes, be yourself, everyone else is taken. And there's a truth to that. We can't be anything else. To be authentic is to have an attitude of openness and honesty and humility. Another advert on TV that we see is the one with people suffering depression or anxiety. When the door closes and everyone has gone home, they peel off this mask, and yet then you can see who they really are. Don't wear a mask. Be authentic. How can we help one another if we're not honest in how we genuinely feel? Be the same person in public and in private. And yes, we all want to say, how are you? If I ask you tonight, how are you? You'll say, I'm grand. If I stop and five minutes later and says, well, how are you really? I might start to get into how you are really. Paul says, now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. You see, I love that. Because it gives us the real opportunity to be ourselves. And Paul writes that in this wonderful discourse on love in 1 Corinthians. So what we can see what God's kingdom is like. Because there we are fully known by God and others. And we are fully loved by God and others. This is a model for what it means to live in a Christian community. In other words, to be the church. If someone opens up about a struggle in their lives, we don't react with shock and shame. We are honored. Someone has trusted us at a very deep level, and we seek to be an encourager and listener. And we begin to show them at a deeper level, and we grow to love them on a deeper level. And that kind of special relationship that comes through the Holy Spirit will develop. A relationship that was not possible before. One of the great things and the great blessing for me in my ministry is that when people talk about the churches that we have around us, and especially in Methodism, one of the things that they talk about is about the people being real. They are who they say they are. You meet people on the door, and they are. You know what struggles they've been through. They don't put a face on it. They don't try to pretend there's something they're not. And that's what will welcome people in, 
Because what we want is real people to come through our doors. We don't pretend we have all the answers. We don't pretend we have it all together. That's why we come together and worship together and fellowship together, to encourage one another and build each other up, to let each other know we're not alone and we too have made mistakes. We are a church family and we support each other. A second key attitude is to be more healthy, is to be of good cheer. Now that sounds difficult, especially at a time when it's just in the last three weeks we've had two services here in this church where we have remembered loved ones who we've lost either this year or in previous years. So how can you be of good cheer if your heart is heavy? Well, you can't be of good cheer if you're constantly thinking about how bad and terrible the world is. If you're focused on the end of the world, we cannot live in the present and enjoy the fellowship of those around us. How we can ever convince the world that we are people of hope and of good news if all we talk about is bad news? We need to spread the good news, the gospel. And that's part of having a new attitude. Yes, draw alongside someone. Yes, acknowledge their hurt and pain, but offer them a hope. We have to love the world as God loves the world. Jesus himself said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace in this world. You will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Can okay, easier said than done, but yes, but here is the words of Scripture. We are often discouraged about the lack of knowledge in people, about a Christian perspective, ideas, and worldviews. I was at a meeting recently and they said, oh, Christianity, as you've probably seen in the news, is down to 49% of the population. What they didn't say in that same report is that other faiths, humanism, was down 35% to a total of 10,000. We all face different challenges in the world, but our joy and our privilege is to spread the good news. Our hope, we want to be in this generation or the generation to come, but our hope should rely on the kingdom of God to continue moving on regardless of what the news headline may be. And this is what we should be taking in to 2023 for us. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing. Those are the words in Matthew's gospel. Take heart in them. The kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing. Now, we may not be privileged to see it, but it is happening. It is like the leaven in the dough which does its work secretly. It's like the seed planted in the ground that springs up unexpectedly. It's like God appearing to Elijah, not in the earthquake, wind, or fire, but in a gentle whisper. The reality is that we cannot stop the kingdom of God. And as we heard in Romans, yes, we will have difficult times, but that will build perseverance and that will build character and that will build hope. We are a people of hope. We have to be. For us, sorrow is there, but it is temporary. And joy is the norm. The reason that we know that life overcomes death is because love is stronger than hate. Light overcomes darkness and will ultimately triumph. You know, Proverbs is a wonderful book to dip into at times. And again, it's easy. A cheerful heart is good medicine. And that's true. But so is a positive attitude. But a positive attitude that is great, sorry, grounded in the scriptures, that is grounded in the people around you. But perhaps the greatest thing that we need to have to have a new attitude for a new year is to be aware of God. Don't ask God, where are you? Look for him. If you drive, especially in country roads, you'll see nailed to trees the signs, Jesus is coming. He's coming? No, he's already here. He's here through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Yes, he will return, but it's not a future thing. It's a present thing. Sometimes we can be so focused on the second coming that we forget that he has already come and has not abandoned the world. This is where we get our hope from. The kingdom of God has been established on earth, and we are the ones, as we seek to move from one year to the next, who are charged with carrying that forward. A question, rhetorical. What if we lived every moment as though God was all around us? What if you lived as though nothing could happen to you that God could not take care of? That's a big challenge, I think. And it's hard because the pressures of life are so difficult. I'll put it another way. Could we live as if we had one foot already in heaven? And that heaven was in fact all around you. Could we do that? Maybe that's another way to look at it. Or here's a simpler way. What if we lived the life and went into the new year as though the power of the Holy Spirit lived in us, as Jesus promised us? In the world where we live in, we have the power of the Holy Spirit. Could divide the sight of a sunset or a sun rising or a tree or a flower or a cloud inspire us to say thank you, Lord, for your creation. A new awareness, a new attitude could literally change our lives. It was in 1741 and an old man was wandering the streets of London. His name was George Frederick Handel. At this point, he was very angry at life. His mind kept going back to the time when he was famous and had the applause of royals and the elite of London. But now his mind was full of despair and hopelessness about the future. The applause had faded away. Others were now in the spotlight. And envy began to possess him. Added to that, he had a brain hemorrhage paralyzing his right side. He could no longer write and doctors gave little hope for recovery. The old composer traveled to France and began to soak in the baths, which were said to have healing effects. The hot mineral baths seemed to help, and his health began to improve. Eventually, he was able to write once more, and his success returned. But then, in life, he faced another reversal. Queen Caroline, who had been his staunch supporter, died. England found itself in hard economic times, and heating large auditoriums for concerts was no longer permitted. Sound familiar? His performances were cancelled, and he began to wonder where God was. Then one night as he returned from his walk, Charles Jennings was waiting at his home. Jennings explained that he had just finished writing a text for a musical that covered both the Old and the New Testaments and believed that Handel was the man to set it to music. Initially, Handel was indifferent and he began to read the words which Jennings had put together. But then his eyes fell on such words as, he was despised, rejected of men. He looked for someone to have pity on him, but there was no man. Neither found he any to comfort him. His eyes then raced ahead in the words. He trusted in God. God did not leave his soul in hell. He will give you rest. And finally his eyes stopped on the words, I know that my Redeemer liveth. It is said that at this point he became aware of the presence of God. He was aware in a new and profound way. And as he picked up his pen, the Spirit of God was moving and the music seemed to flow through him. He finished the first part in only seven days. The section, the second in six. Many will remember that when the classical work was first performed in London and the Hallelujah Chorus was sung by the choir, King George II was so moved that he stood to his feet. To this day, people still rise to their feet as the great chorus is sung in praises to God. In reflecting on Handel's Messiah, 
the author Joseph McCabe wrote, Never again are we to look at the stars as we did when we were children and wonder how far is it to God. A being outside our world would be a spectator looking on but taking no part in this life where we try to be brave despite all the bafflement. A God who created and withdrew could be mighty but he could not be love. Who could love a God remote when suffering is our lot? Our God is closer than our problems, for they are out there to be faced. He is here beside us, Emmanuel. This is the kind of attitude that we need to work on and take into the new year. This is part of my reflection for the new year. What do I want to be seen to do, to work at in the new year. May God bless us in whatever places or tasks he has put us to in the new year. Amen. I'm going to ask you again just to turn to your sheets and then to this, the back page and it's prayers for the New Year's Eve. And again, if you would just share with me in the final paragraph in the bold type. Let us again unite our heart in prayer on this New Year's Eve. Eternal God, before whom we are creatures of the day and children of the hour, we lift our prayers to you as we stand in the shadows of the waning year. We are aware once more of the fleetiness of time and the transistency of our being. So much has happened to us during the year, so rapidly slipping away. So much of hurt and happiness, of loss and gain, of hope and fear. We did not expect the sorrow that was thrust upon us. We were surprised by the turn of events that changed our lives. We look back. We remember how different life was a year ago. The slow, quiet erosion of the days has gone on, and we are not quite the same person as we were, for better, for worse. We've had a whole year to grow in love or to fall out of love, to turn our hands to constructive tasks or to turn away in idleness. We've had a whole year, and now it is almost gone. No matter what we have done or failed to do, O Lord, keep us from dwelling on it too much. If we have failed, help us put the failure behind us. If we have done well, help us to be glad but not complacent. There are other hills to climb and new hopes to be realized. And we say together, we know, O God, you understand our need to do back for a while, wistfully peering at the past, but start us looking forward. We do not know what events are ahead, but we do know you are there, and we are grateful. Amen. And we just turn to the back of the hymn sheet to our final hymn. As I said, I I give that address a title of A New Attitude for a New Year, and it's all about being in the presence of God. And the hymn that come to mind, and I thought of a couple of hymns, but the one that come to me was just, Be thou my vision, of Lord of my heart. Be all else, but not to me, save that thou art. Be my best thought in the day and the night, both waking and sleeping, thy presence, my light. And the third thing that I said was to see God And to me, this verse speaks of seeing and being in the presence of God.
to your sheets and at the bottom there's a benediction and I just think it would be lovely perhaps if we shared in this together and then we'll follow it with the words of the grace. Go from this place, not into darkness, although it is night. Go into the light of God's eternal, inspiring love. Go to be those who bring peace, love, hope and joy and God will always be with you. Amen. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.